All right. What's up, y'all? <laughs> Welcome to the Poetry Den, where words once written on a page are now performed on stage and solidarity extends between poets and friends. I'm going to clap for you for being here. So, yeah. So, uh, tonight we are uh, celebrating uh, 10 years in the making. Um, uh, we started doing this 2012 at uh, Merriman's Playhouse. We were there two years um, and had some transition. And we got here, we landed here, we settled in because of the good love of the people that run this place and give of their time uh, every fourth Sunday of the month here. They come away from their families to be with us. And so I'm uh, extremely grateful for the Civil Rights Heritage Center. How many is your first time in here? All right. So as due diligence, um, first of all, um, I always want, this is a historical landmark in the city. Uh, and so they have restored, the people of this community, and uh, along with IUSB, um, have rallied to keep this, this building. And so it has significance, it has history, it's a part of our history. And so I like to do due do, do diligence uh, by having one of our guys, or have, looks like George is doing it, <laughs> uh, and having George come and share about uh, this space, what happens in this space. He's got, a, he's got plenty of um, elevator speeches for us. So. Also, I want to say thank you to all of you that are joining us virtually. Thank you for being with us. Look forward to hearing from you or just look forward to having you with us. So, George, if you give it up for George, he's going to come and share. Pam, thank you. Thank you, everyone, coming here for the first time, coming here for the thousandth time uh, and everywhere in between. It's an absolute joy to welcome everybody. Um, you know, like Pam was saying, uh, we think it's just incredibly important to root what we're doing here tonight in what had happened here before. Because we stand in a place of injustice. We stand in the site of the former Engman Public Natatorium, the city of South Bend's first indoor municipal swimming pool. And they intentionally and deliberately used that word public. And it's that that we think about. Who was it who used that word? And to whom were they applying the meaning? Because for 14 years, the people who ran the city-owned pool, frankly, people who look like me, specifically and deliberately denied the meaning of that word to include all people. And then for another 14 after, chose only certain days. So for 30 years, this public pool, this place that everyone should have had a right to come into, was denied. As we're living through yet another onslaught of fundamental human rights. The world we live in in 2020 is not fundamentally dissimilar than the world they lived in in 1922. Right? Every generation has to make that commitment to standing up for fundamental human rights. And it's our job now here. There are a whole host of ways to do that. March it in the streets, as we've seen, standing up to levers of government and power, and sometimes just standing in solidarity with a whole wide swath of humanity. This is a radical act. For a place that selected who could come in and who couldn't, for all of us to gather here today in solidarity with friends is a radical <coughs> act. And I am so grateful for the privilege, Pam, that you have given us over six years in this place, but 10 years in this community of giving us the excuse, <laughs> the privilege, the place to gather in solidarity and friends to do this radical act that is gathering and sharing joy. So Pam, thank you for 10 years, for six years, and for so many more. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thank you uh, so much. Um, again, if you didn't know my name, it is Pam Blair. <laughs> um, 
We have, if you didn't see it out there, there was a sign-up sheet that looks a lot like this, so if you did not sign up to read um, and you want to read, uh, this is a sign-up sheet for you to do that. Um, there, there might be a cutoff after a while, so if you want to get on, it'd be great to get on. We've got a great list going on here for our open mic, and then we have a featured artist. Uh, also, there's next to that table, you might have saw some swag, I mean, some shirts like this, some wristbands, some pens, some notepads, all of that is for you. So help yourself to that. There's also, we have some snacks out there until they're gone. It's coffee, tea, and cookies uh, with, from a great donation from um, Dan Bremen, uh, who donated that to us. So I know he's not here tonight, but thank him for that. He's been really instrumental in that, as well as uh, um, contributing to the poetry then, often with his poetry. So how this works, we do an open mic. I kind of randomly call you. You come up. Uh, we'll stick to like five minutes if you can at all do that. And I won't throw rotten tomatoes at you while you're up here. Um, and then we end with our featured artists. So again, settle in. Um, also, if you, there's, there's bathrooms that are in the corner back there. Um, if you use the hand dryer, We'll all know when you got done using the bathroom. But that's fine, because we want to know that you're coming back. Um, also, if you can silence your phones, that'd be great. If you take a phone call and you go in that hallway, guess what? We're going to hear your conversation. So if you don't want us to hear your conversation, or somebody might be like, shh, which is even more disturbing than the phone conversation. Uh, just because this place has a, you know, it has great sound, uh, and so it's just easy to hear all the things that we're talking about. So. Um, and we want to be able to hear the poet. Uh, it's one reason why we chose a spot versus a coffee house is because we wanted to make sure that people could come and hear the poets and not hear what everybody's drinking for the night. So, um, yeah. So again, glad to have you all here. I hope you enjoy tonight. Um, my phone is back there, so it's going to force me to do something. Uh, Actually, can you pass me a phone? Maybe I. <laughs> I was gonna. <laughs> was, but then. Where are you gonna sit down? Is it not on the chair? Maybe it's not. It might force me to do something by memory, which that's not a problem. <clears throat> All right, great, 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 great. <clears throat> All right. Everybody, good. Awesome. Very curious about this thing, though. About what? Whatever you're being forced to do. Oh, my poetry? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a. <laughs> was it a dance? Was it yeah. a song? Who's to say? It's funny because I just thought about it and I was like, well, I was actually the priest that I was going to read now. I plan to read later. So I might as well do something forced. We'll just do that. How about that? We'll do something that somebody's heard before. <laughs> um, this piece is called. Uh, what is this piece called? This piece is called The Mirror. Let's do The Mirror. I know you guys have heard this before. Alan is there. I bet, Alan, you probably could recite this yourself. I'm sure you've heard it many times. <laughs> uh, and this piece I kind of wrote to myself, but um, I always tell my poets that come and join us that it doesn't matter if you do repeats, there's somebody here that hasn't heard it before. And so that's always a nice thing about it. But um, this piece I'll do, it was, I wrote to myself. Sensuous in your behavior, yet you waver to love because of fear. Fear that the past is too close to the present. And even though that shit is irrelevant, you can't see the future because you refuse to look in the mirror. A mirror you no longer smile in, for all you see is old wineskin because you've been drinking all the wrong words. Drunk on words that have destroyed your self-confidence and the evidence is you have not yet claimed your inheritance. There is beauty in your eyes. And the beasts are the lies that try and fertilize seeds of unforgiveness lying on the inside. You see, in order to love another, one must discover your own sleeping beauty. Maybe become the author of the book, I am pretty. And I like myself. I like myself because of the image of who I was made, a creator who promised never to leave me, but as long as I want it will stay. And I'll bathe myself in his blood that cleanses me from the stench 
of the day. A day that I will one day understand that church, family, and school weren't the only plan, but having dominion over my life, hopes, thoughts, actions, and dreams might help my fellow man. So when I look in the mirror, whom shall I fear? False accusations, manipulation, devastation, or do I start a revolution beginning with internal evolution when I look in the mirror? That's that piece. All right. All right, we're just gonna jump right into this tonight. And I'm gonna ask my first person to be uh, Alan. I know, you want, you don't wanna go first? You ready? Come on down, y'all give it up for Alan, please. Welcome everyone, and I always feel like this is such a sacred place when I enter this hall. Um, I've been reading some nursery rhymes. Why? Well, we have a lot of hate, putting people down, all that happening now, and apparently it's not new. So I wanted to interpret the nursery rhyme. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread, then whipped them all soundly and put them to bed. A really sad story if you look at it. If we look closer, we see she's not an old woman. She's a woman worn down, a poor woman, a woman with no support, a woman uneducated, possibly a woman abused, but she's doing the best she can. No, she did not live in a real shoe, just an empty shoe factory, cold, drafty, no heat. Yes, she had a lot of children. All her men promised support. All the men disappeared before the child was born. She fed them what she could find or beg, broth, no bread, not even government cheese. Many nights hungry, going to bed, tiny stomachs growling and children whipping whimpering and sobbing, so hungry and cold. She did what she learned from her childhood, whipped them, whipped them, whipped them, crying children hungry and sore from the whippings they bore. Always more to a story than is first told. Thank you. Next two are gonna be one, a re some repeats. I know this is one Daryl enjoyed. It's called Two Men Digging a Basement. Two men digging a basement by hand, a basement under the house, hard work, hard pan soil. Digging every evening, digging after full day's work, tired of digging, tired of the, from the workday job. Taking a break, back to digging, upstairs a tired wife cooking, Cooking a dinner, dinner for the diggers, she, tired, she also tired from the day job. Shop, cook, and then maybe rest, looking for a break, just looking for rest. They dig every night, she cooks every night. When will it end? Turning ham in the skillet, digging a basement under the house. A good idea back at the end of winter, sitting around with beers. Digging through March, April, May, June, great progress. Now hard pan, no progress July, now August. Hot, humid, tired. What if we drill a few holes in that hard pan? What if we use just a tiny bit of dynamite? Loosen that hard pan, loosen the job. Loose dirt, just shovel. What started as a joke, what started as a conversation, conversation of two tired men, one inch drill bit, four holes, just a tiny bit, Delmer, Walt said. Don't wanna move the house, don't want to do any damage. Each hole filled, an arm, fuse strung out from under the house. Ham removed from the skillet, eggs now taking place. Cigarette lit, touched to the fuse. Fuse made a slow progression, now under the house. The skillet moved like in an earthquake. The stove as well, the four, 
floorboards gained altitude, wife now dusty, tired, and pissed. <laughs> Damn you, Delmer, screamed, racing out of the house. No more cooking, no more, no more. Diggers back under the house, dust, debris, hard pan, now free, free from being trapped. Walk to Delmer, maybe just a tiny bit too much. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and I have my last one, um, something I observed in San Francisco when I was sitting in a bar one evening. I am not the old man I refer to, but uh, uh, it's called The Bar Across from City Lights Bookstore. Old man at the bar may have been there all day, in for the long haul. Three young women at the bar talking, drinking, having a good time. Second stool from the old man, empty stool between him and a woman wearing low cut jeans, sporting a plumber's track, crack, white thong more than peaking. Old man drinks, stares at the thong, enjoying the view, enjoying the brew. Without warning, the thong, yes, the thong failed ripping out of the jeans fast as a slingshot. The old man jerks, string hanging flaccid and limp, dead elastic hanging over jeans. The old man wonders, rope burn, string burn, blistered ass. The old man turns to his beer, young woman turns to the restroom. Just another beer, bartender. Thank you. <laughs> Alan, thank you so much. Can you give it up one more time for Alan, please? I think I'm gonna say this right, Tanya? Am I saying that right? Tanya, Tanya, this is Tanya's, uh, now your first time doing poetry with us, but first time here. So please give her a round of applause as she comes up and shares her poetry with us. Good evening. So wonderful to be with all of you warm people. And if you're just joining us, I know there are other chairs up here that could be moved and placed for you. Great. Okay, how many of you have written a poem and at first you're like, this is so good. And then five minutes later, you throw it away. Come on. Okay. <laughs> we, we are critics. We're always judging ourselves. So uh, this is uh, an ars poetica of uh, our kinds here. It's called The Poem. I played with my poem a while. It was morning, then noon, and swiftly starry night. I indented, I blotted, I underlined and plotted. I changed the I am to a trochee, a synonym to a simile, which pleased me, then perplexed me. It was better, it was worse. It promised blessings, it bubbled forth curses. Finally, I did what many and many a poet has done before. I ripped and I wrinkled, I padded and I crinkled until it was a nice little ball, my strength and all, a neat little ball, which Kitty, pretty Kitty, was delighted to chase, to bounce and to pounce until, like the others, it rolled out of reach. Again, she purrs her pudgy side against my leg my sole audience in this solitary house, my critic extraordinaire demanding, make me another, encore, encore. <laughs> um, is there time for another short one like that? Yeah. Okay, so just really quick here. Uh, hmm. uh, one about um, Shakespeare or secretary. Mm. Oh, let's do a little. You, you want to one about a board secretary or a reference to uh, Hamlet? The board secretary. Okay, the audience speaks. I love how poetry belongs to the people. Okay, this is a shout out to anyone who's had an office job which they hated. Okay, anyone. Okay, I see you. I see you. Okay, it's called A Secretary Takes Five. In between the phone calls and copy machine breakdowns, while the fax inks black messages from metropolis to metropolis, I breathe, 
I continue to exist and I remember poetry. Ah, the warm days of barefoot reading, big sun on our back, sipping ice water and rhymes, spreading out both spines. Better than this, better than the buzzing and the click, click, clicking, dirty windows, parking lots, tired fingers on keyboards, and the large, lonely-faced clocks ticking on till doomsday or the market crash. Dullness is a leading cause of death. It passes through carbon copy after carbon copy after carbon copy, but all the same, stopping the heart. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, one more time for Tanya, please. <clears throat> also, it seems that you all know what to do. Like if someone's reading, you know, it's like, mm, oh, okay. You can also snap, you can say, say that, say that again, anything that you, that I feel like that always gives some, some backing to uh, the poet that's up here. But we're gonna keep rolling because we got quite a, a big list today. So I'm going to ask um, John, yeah, come on up, John. John. John does an, a poetry event in um, Elkhart called, is it Wordplay? Yeah. Yeah, Wordplay. You can tell him about that a little okay, bit if you'd like cool. to. Um, but it's a great, I'm glad that Elkhart's doing something. He's been uh, extremely faithful in caring that to put the bookworm. And so, yeah, I'm going to hand Thanks. it Yeah, so um, we uh, do um, every second Friday at the Bookworm on Main Street, and uh, we've, I think we've only been doing it about seven years, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing, and uh, I started coming here, and uh, Pam was real helpful and real supportive, and I really appreciate um, all she did. And uh, so, um, I got, a, I got a poem, um, this is called Meeting Jesus. I met Jesus in the flesh one day. He was on a delayed, delayed flight at Midway, sitting in a terminal reading USA Today as he sipped a caramel latte in that familiar red cup. He turned to me and said, if this paper were a fig tree, I'd command it to never bear fruit again. But with its declining market share, I don't think it's even worth the curse. He threw the paper in the trash, smiled at me and said, forgive me. Forgive the snit, elections make me terse. I looked in his eyes, he's not what I expected. Facebook doesn't do him justice. The meme should be rejected. Though I hate to admit it, Flavor Flav was right. You can't believe the hype. He's not a vegan hippie cleansing your chakra, promoting a diet of soybeans. He's not a capitalist investor seeking tax breaks for the one percenters to provide minimum wage jobs for all. Just like he knew what I was thinking, he began to speak. When I said no graven images, no one seemed to get my beef. It's more than just worshiping a creep instead of the creator. I told Moses my name was I am that I am. That means you don't get to define me your way. I'm not your personal archetype, the exact reverse of all that irritates. I'm not a Republican, Democrat, or Socialist, Libertarian, Green Party, or Communist. You can't put me in your square slots. I am the whole and not the parts. I didn't ask you to start a culture war, pay for a lobbyist and image consultant because all your experts think I can't be relevant. Your attempts to fix things are interference, self-justified, self-absorbed nonsense. And contrary to popular belief, clicking like and share won't make a difference. <laughs> I know you're sincere, but wrong is still wrong. Quit trying to fix everyone. That's not your job. I didn't die and shed my blood so you could try and take the credit. Respond in love, spread my word. The gospel means good news. We don't need another set of rules and regulations. I'm looking for a real relationship, for you to listen to things I said, not just make it up as you go along. Truth exists in a scary place. Branches, thorns, and brambles, monsters made of shadows. On that long, long road home, let me help you find the way. Thank you. Thank you. 
And as we know, there's the old saying um, about uh, that um, if you chain monkeys to a type, a whole bunch of monkeys to a typewriter, that they would eventually type Shakespeare. Well, that's that's what that's what this poem is is based on. The rights of monkeys. What gives me the right to speak truth? Should only the winner speak? Ted talkers with coiffed hair, gigantic PowerPoint screens expressing cleverness. I have parts of my life in disarray, daily repeat bonehead moves. My sock drawer is not up to established standards. Yet a hopeful vision came to me, the spirit of truth hovering over the waters. Tohu and Bohu, a most excellent mess, upside down, inside out, God's best expressed through mediocre vessels. An, ac an accountant playing a shaky version version of Fear Elise on a cello, a line drive snatched out of the air by the kid who was last to be chosen, poetry by the kid that flunked ninth grade grammar, love shown best through those who deserve it least, monkeys typing Shakespeare, foolish things confound the wise, truth, love, and justice thriving outside of the city gates, tarnished brass playing the sweetest song of all, lest the monkeys have no way to irritate the impressive. Thank you. And um, because Alan did uh, um, a fairy tale um, poem, I've got one that's called Happily Ever After. And uh, this was published in Peculiar's magazine. I don't know if they're still up or not, but they were. Um, Happily Ever After. They said they lived happily ever after. That's what the story said. The abused stepchild employed as a domestic slave, losing her parents, suffering intimacy issues, unable to attach easily, post-traumatic stress, huge gaps in formal education, originating from the lowest of the socioeconomic classes. The palace steward suspects hallucinations, possibly drug-related, as she told the story of the fairy godmother and mice changing to footmen and a pumpkin to a coach. While she probably stole the dress, that doesn't explain those shoes. Married to a member of the ruling class, a pompously, classically educated prig, strutting about with mili in a military uniform, complete with sword, when he has never even been in a fist fight. After the honeymoon, she tried to get used to the new form of slavery, dressing up every day, putting on a show like a prancing pony for this ambassador or that king. At first, the staff didn't like her putting on airs. Imagine the cheek, not a proper princess. But as time went on, her kindness and humility won them over. They even helped hide her pet mouse. Yeah. And one more. Okay, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, I grew up in the town of Bend, Oregon, out in, uh, yeah, totally, totally different than Indiana. Um, Angela, seventh grade at Central Oregon Academy. She was a slim, dark-haired waif with large eyes. Her name was Angela. She had few friends and was terminally shy. I put a flower in her locker, and I thought no one saw it. She wrote in my yearbook, I love you, write me during summer. Three letters sent, none received, but she never spoke to me again. But I heard her read the letters to others. Girls are weird. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, forgive me not. Good. Yeah. <laughs> you know about forget me not. <laughs> Give it up for John one more time, please. All right, we're going to keep her rolling here. Let's see. Uh, Ralph, if Ralph and his wife Lisa are on. In order to get through kind of all of our open mics, we're just going to keep asking people to keep it at five minutes. So that'd be awesome. There's Lisa. Is Ralph with you too? He's here. He's gonna. I have to turn off the virtual background. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so you can you see wife, me, everybody? Yeah, we can see you. So we're gonna do five minutes with you and your wife. Is that good? All right. Can you? All right. Take your thing out. 
Can you see me, everybody? Yeah. I'm going to do second. I'm going to do four, three in rapid succession. We're going to take you on a journey from swinging London in 65 to the cynical 70s, to the rocky shores of Queensland and a certain recent catastrophic social event. So this is Waiting for the Bang. Marquee Club, 65, Innocence Discarded, Different Dreams Charted, Guitar Rumbles Ignited, Crushed Hot Kisses Stolen Between Cold Sweats, Ears Ringing After Every Set, Teen Power Dreams Unleashed, Still Living and Breathing for Old Ravers Like Me Who Never Gave a Damn, Still Waiting for the Bang. Okay, onward and upward. This is, this was published in Panoply's April uh, issue, March, April, and we had to write to an image. And so this accompanied people running down a water slide. So this was what popped into my head. Recalling the before times, 1975 style. Ah, the amusement park where the roller coaster rolled our bones and the flickering Ferris wheel shook us cold. As mom and dad promised, son, you can have whatever you want. Until the MO of adulthood sucker punched us right between the eyes. Out went the dreams, out went the lights. Life's funny like that sometimes. Okay, off to the shores of Queensland, my tribute to the Saints late lead singer, Chris Bailey, who left us in April at the age of 65. What's this have to do with the price of rice, you ask? Well, he and the Saints unleashed the third punk single, I'm Stranded, in August of 76. One of many reasons he earned his place in history and forever after. So this is called Stranded on a Saturday Night. Brisbane, Pig City, hard to explain to those that weren't there. Oh, no, he's telling you to stand by. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Can you hear it? Can you take this out? I can't. Oh, they're saying they lost the feed. Oh. <laughs> Can you take this out? I'll never be able to hear them. No, I, I got I got the I got the headphones out so they right. can hear you. Okay. Okay, we'll just wait. I wonder I can hear anything coming in. Yeah. Guess we can play the time killing music. Dun 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 dun. Whatever they play. Now I've got the speakers. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Now I can, yeah, now I can. <laughs> because we're not good at foresight. We don't see the hits come. Okay. And we're not good at justice. Take a look at the system. We overstuff our prisons. Don't you dare step out of line. And even if you don't, we'll still sentence you to life. Your daddy broke the law, so we'll punish you too. Take away all your support, still expect you to do school. Confine you to a desk, say you have ADHD. Get you dependent on your meds, now you got anxiety. Then we get a pandemic. Now the children were left behind, but if they couldn't keep up to begin with, we got a different kind of sickness. Like an exploding star, the end is near. No one knows when, but if the death of children are signaling it's here, then it's been here since the very beginning. That's my piece. Uh, this next one um, was one that was kind of helping me process some stuff. So in spring of 2021, I lost my Nana. It was a pretty hard time for me and my family. So this is just kind of go through that. Um, 
I wanted to kill myself on Tuesday. I just got an essay back and I got a C. It was a pretty shitty paper and it probably deserved a D. I thought I was being overdramatic, but at the same exact time, my papa had received the ashes of my nana. I guess I wanted a little more compassion from the universe. I had no more energy left to subdue my worst thoughts and reactions, visceral attacks. I've spent years fighting back, conditioning responses and building my conscience to be crushed the instant my Nana turned unresponsive. She died two weeks ago, and for the first week, everyone was super sweet and understanding, supportive and caring, helping me. bad grades made her seasick. <laughs> but knowing that she passed without me getting to say goodbye made me sick. Nana, I miss you every day. Eight months have gone by and it hurts just the same. I'm not ready to face the holidays without you. I just hope you know I love you and I hope I made you proud too. That's so cool. I just want to say congratulations, first of all, to Ben, who just graduated from the University of Notre Dame. Um, pressed through, pressed through and made it. And I know it wasn't easy because I work there. And so. <laughs> Did I say that? It's not being really recorded, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for being here. Um, now, Lisa. Bro, well, Ralph should be back. All right, is Lisa, am I gonna? All right, Ralph's here. All right, you ready to? I'm here. You ready to chime in where you left off at? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Okay, back we go then to the rocky shores of Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> so once more, stranded on a Saturday night, take one and a half. Brisbane, Pig City, hard to explain to those that weren't there. A place that chased history, the police brutality, the rank stupidity, a place where poetry could never occur. We had our own hillbilly dictator, Joe Bielke Peterson, and we had the saints, musical revolutionaries in the city's evil heart. I'm stranded, my gateway drug into punk. My mom still laments. That coat, those badges, forever in their debt. Stone forever as I walk down the hall. Ah, forever young. Thank you. Okay. Closer for the night. Okay. Um, and this might become part of something epic and longer because, well, the beauty of desperate times is what? You'll never have stuff to, you'll never run out of stuff to write about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So there you go. This is called Midnight the Sixth. <clears throat> Note to self, words to the wise after January 6th. Whatever doesn't kill you can still kill you. A flagpole aimed like a javelin is still a javelin. Bear spray doesn't smell like hairspray, and cut and run is definitely the lesser of two evils here. What else did we miss? A clown with a flamethrower still has a flamethrower. Midnight the sixth, watch the countdown continue to tick, walking the tightrope between the unthinkable and the unimaginable and the unforgivable. No more margin left for error, no more rain checks left on the thunder of the mob and its brand X of terror. Whatever happens, don't slip and don't look down because we're just about out of second mistakes. Thank you. Well, I got some poems now too. I got some next, right? Yeah. All right. I have two today to do. 
One is based on what I did genealogy and what I found out about my ancestors via genealogy. Where is my tribe? You have a heart of bread, she told me. You are a true Native American. I wanted to be, you see. I was dreaming of my real family, the aunties with dreams and spirituality behind their eyes, music in their souls, who loved art and connected with the cosmos. Instead, I was stuck in their house of those without inner dialogue, where all songs were silenced long ago. No culture, no culture, no Irish blood even in my veins as I was led to believe. One parent falling through the ice as a child, but rescued by a human chain. Bring me here to this place by chance. According to ancestry, real grandfather was a womanizer sowing multiple children and cousins and his wild oats from Florida to New Jersey. One of those great aunts escaping her orphanage became a real estate mogul. Grandmother was busy getting fellow neighbors committed to the true full 1950s psych ward to get top billing in her bridge club and having an affair and a baby out of wedlock. She would hold a citywide party for his seventh birthday after he dried out from his journey under the ice, ensuring his golden child status. He had grown up to tell his children his family were multimillionaires and owned a racetrack, but his own father had looked nothing like him and he never seemed to suspect was a janitor at a munitions plant. One great uncle I never met was a mechanic in South Bend, Indiana. Long dead, his children's ties were too fragile for any meeting. He came from the line of the 450 pound Hungarian former army captain who ruined my body with his bad legs and DNA. So many children, so many greats lost in the crowd with the branches being whittled. whittled. There were bootleggers and mobsters importing booze under prohibition and breaking into houses and union heads of textile workers arranging strikes and fighting the scabs and way too many farmers and factory workers, but at least two had black marble gravestones over 20 feet high. One great grandfather who had a gilded golden angel on top and a photograph of himself framed within the marble from the branch of the family I never met. He stared out for eternity. That Hungarians, the strict Germans all dissolving into the melting pot from tenements and wooden two-story houses and two small towns, both families populated for 150 years before the 1960s came along and took away extended families and left us alone in suburban cages with even fewer to be connected to. Oddly, pieces of my face seem to appear here and there, but never my personality. The only other artist is a second cousin who painted teacups and made tidy quilts. One old distant 96-year-old cousin kept driving his car the wrong way down the street without a license, earning himself a four-page spread in the newspaper. They put him in jail. That's the end of that one, huh? I'm gonna say we cut out. Did they lose you? Yeah, they said they cut out again. Okay. Are they bringing you back? Wait. Hmm? Are they bringing you back? I don't know. <clears throat> Lisa, did you have anything you wanted to finish or are you all set? All right, I can do the other one now if you want. It's up to you. Uh, it, it, but All right. If, if we cut off again, then it might pull be. My hand. <laughs> Go for it if you'd like to, Lisa. All right. Two, two seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second one is called the Wanderers of Society. They raised my rent. Some of us never got connected. 
wandered, wandering from one white painted box to the next in a geography of nowhere. No, no name erased in the dust. This earth is not my home. No place among the gravestones as the world burns for the fourth turning. I started life in a Truman Show, Levitt Town, like housing development, a strange suburban outpost in the middle of nowhere with an IGA, square school buildings and farms down the street, and 40 to 50 mile commutes for the suited fathers who always came home too late. Next came the huge eastern metro city full of lawyers, and my elementary school classmates would join their column firms after the nuns across the street educated them. This town had a park full of old oak trees to be hidden in after my newspaper route was finished. There was a subway, department stores, a mini golf course, and my Vietnamese friend's house to eat bowls of duck curry with rice. Then my future was ruined on the eve of my 13th birthday as I was dragged to a dying factory filled Midwestern town where the air always smelled like cereal and iron and people married by 18. College came to, in an overcrowded town with few jobs and pizza shops named after hobbits. So many lines to wait in, so many boarding houses and small single rooms with my bed in the middle, always with one, oh, is it going out again? <laughs> All right. Lotto ticket. The low flying fog lowers, glowers gray the sky, renders the line between earth and firmament undefined. For a moment, the night is gauzy and overawed. 23 carat Mary with her million lumens glare the gloom. Darkness is conquered not by love or sacrifice, but by a half dozen spotlights. Assurance and creed I have none. Wisdom too is in short supply, but what I have I offer you. The surest way to do religion wrong is to start coating things with gold. Nightfall falls further, and now she, even she, smotherer of smog, is shrouded by the pillar and pallor of cloud. In a nearby woods lies a shrine, Christ brutalized in bronze, and tonight two owls unseeingly string the treetops with the question of every age since, who, who, who is this man? Presently, a statue. The ancient trees ache from the weight in the breeze. Leaves humid, sweat shined, droop. Beside the wood is a lake and the felt muck scent coalesces with the earth turned leaves of yesteryear. Autumn is early, already here. The water teems with steam like a perpetual outbreath. The surrounding air is no longer air, it is atmosphere. Fog shawl, pearl plume, vapor impervious, now descends darkness indivisible. Night mist, the lightless bright, now the cloud unknown and of unknowing. All is uncertain now. Now no more the lake, no more statues to sadism and gold, no more the wood, no more the imperative to be good, no more the owls, the candles, the trees, no more pigskin piety. All that, all that can be seen is nothing, nothing and me sitting, my back against a giant chrome cross, smoking alone. Contributing what I can. Wow. Thank you. Uh, this next poem is my last poem. Uh, I wrote this after one of the most difficult periods of my life. I had nearly made an attempt on my life, uh, and I wrote this poem about a month later. And I found myself strangely in the aftermath of that, like I felt much better. My mental health was kind of all over the place, but in the moment I wrote this poem, there was a moment of clarity. I was sitting in the back porch of a house in Keller Park neighborhood where I was serving in the community and a cottonwood tree was just all a bloom. And I wanted desperately to be alive and was so glad that I was. And I wanted to be able to capture that and hand that to someone else. And this is my attempt. You tell me if it's successful. Cottonwood. 
Cottonwood trees strew seed the size and speed of bubbles. They wobble in the breeze. Flu floats like particulate fog, like dancing dandelion dander, as if air shed its winter fur like a diaspora of paper lanterns with burning kernels at their cores. How can words capture the rapture of a flurry of tangible clouds? Late May's lazy, hazy comets, aimless silk rayed suns, hovering spit bug condominiums, pearly untethered peonies, or tiny flying Einstein progenies. If only these metaphors could confer the simple felicity of being alive, of a snow globe, life sized. How is it after years of winter, my peace? appears in a blizzard. And all I have to share are these poor phrases, which I still offer, adding only this wish, that you would stay here a little longer. Here, I give you hope's soft white asterisk. Thank you. One more time, thank you, Spencer. Uh, Ralph and Lisa, I'm so sorry about our technical difficulties, and I hope that you can uh, forgive us through all of this. Ralph has been with me for a long time. Actually, we used to do a thing called Expression Session in Ben Harbor, where I used to drive uh, every month. And so I've known him for a long time, and I did ask him to join us. And so I. I feel bad that all of that has happened, but we're going to, hopefully they can forgive me, they'll be back. Um, but Wayne, let's just give it up for Wayne. Do you want to come back up or you want me to stand? Oh no, you're here. <laughs> I asked Pam to stand next to me when I read the poem. You gotta give him inspiration. Yes. <laughs> I was waiting for actually one of these balloons to pop when, uh, Spencer was up here because three of them have already popped, and I was Ooh. like, "Yeah, I was like, Ooh. Man. Uh, George, would you come over?" Is George coming up too? Yes. Pam's helped a lot of people, and uh, earlier this year, she got me connected with a poetry reading, and before that poetry reading. I became aware that there was an honorarium connected to it. As soon as I learned that, I knew where the cash would go. George, you will know what to do with this. Thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this poem uh, needs a little <laughs> explanation. Uh, some anniversaries are ruby, some are diamond, some are paper. The 10th anniversary, I looked up and it is aluminum, tin, and food. <laughs> and the explanation of tin was food is sometimes stored in tin cans. Mm. <laughs> I want to give you something, Pat. <laughs> Uh, Tan and I were sitting down with some folks Friday afternoon and I shared this poem. Okay. And one of the ladies suggested that for reading the poem, I used the British pronunciation, aluminium. <laughs> this is good. That's how they do it in Britain. Aluminium. Okay. <laughs> Poetry Den at 10. Aluminium, food, and tin bring us to year number 10. The celebration will begin here at the Poetry Den. Aluminium, tin, and food help us find the proper way to set a festive mood 
and recognize this day. In summer's evening breeze, bring out the Coke, beer and rum, sausage, crackers, cheese on platters of aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> and just like an impish elf, being the kind of guy I am, mm -hmm. I'll pull a poem off the shelf that shouts out, thank you, Pam. Bianca, we will save this and put food in it. <laughs> Eat it up. Don't waste that aluminum. I don't know about y'all. I had some folks that would save aluminum. Believe me. No aluminum goes to waste. <laughs> that was awesome. Deb, come on down. I debated whether or not to read this one tonight. And um, sometimes the poems tell you what to do, right? You mm -hmm. kind of think, no, I'm not going to do that one. And then you go, oh, well, I guess I am. Um, <laughs> but I realized I haven't read this one out loud ever. No, that's a lie. I've read it, read, read it to my husband and my sister. Mm -hmm. um, but here we go, if I can find my note. What kind of a God would bless a nation where the children risk their lives to get an education? We have baptized our nation in the blood of the innocent, and for that, we are loath to repent. Who is this God we are trying to satisfy? A pagan deity who demands sacrifice? Is nothing sacred? We are so easily placated. We cast our vote for anyone or anything that promises prosperity. We have sacrificed our children on the altar of our political machine, turned a deaf ear to their cries and their screams, watching from the sidelines as the enemy snuffs out their dreams. The gulf between us is growing increasingly wide and still we cling to our pride. Throwing stones <clears throat> behind our brick walls we hide, ignoring the corollary before the fall goes pride. Unwilling to bridge our political divide, both sides clamoring for a duel when we should be invoking the golden rule. Pointing fingers is our primary occupation, no action taken to improve the current situation. When will our children stop dying in vain? When will we stop watering their graves with tears that fall like rain, chanting the land of the free because of the brave? What is to become of us as a nation when we fail to protect our youngest generation? We are heading for a reckoning, but we slumber, averse to accept an awakening. Our crusades are dragging us through the gates of hell. Our battle cry, all is well. Politicians, pastors, and priests talk about leaving a legacy, still ignoring the smallest and least of these. Singing, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through is not noble, it is simply a lame excuse. Some of us have become so heavenly minded, we are of no earthly good. Thoughts and prayers will not fill the empty chairs. Close your Bibles, leave your ivory towers, roll up your sleeves and get off your knees. Take action, damn it, it's too late for asking pretty please. If America is so great, why all the hate? Life is not a game of zero sum game. Let's live with a spirit of generosity. Silence the demon of scarcity. Teach your children that inclusion and diversity create a world of beauty. And when our neighbor is nourished, we both benefit and flourish. We are in desperate need of a recalibration. This constant escalation is leading us to a destination, an elevation where the air is thin, there is simply not enough oxygen. We are bound to die an avoidable death, willing to chase each other until we breathe our last breath. We need to step down from our pedestal. Our superior complex is not credible. We have sold our collective soul, time to calculate the toll. Cancel our contract with the Green Reaper, give notice to the undertaker. 
Let us recognize that while we mourn and agonize, we can use our pain to be galvanized and mobilized, to overturn the tables in our man-made tabernacles. The solution is not linear, but I do believe we can get there from here. The only way forward is humility. Ask for forgiveness for our own complicity and then enact legislation with teeth so we can stop the blood running through our streets. Last you believe that I'm taking sides, may I suggest this is further evidence of our divide. We have learned to identify and quantify relationships through the lens of a binary party system. We no longer see each other as fellow citizens until we know if we share our political position. Let me assure you the solution to this dire state is well above my pay grade. There are two sides to this debate and we need to come together before it's too late. We have created a no man's land. If anyone dare to enter, they are abandoned, left to sink all alone in the quagmire of quicksand. Let's pitch our tents and take up residence, a movement of resistance, a community of dissidents, united for a cause that is greater than our affiliations for the good of our nations. May the land between become fertile and green, an incubator, a garden of Eden, where we discover our way back to each other, a place for compromise and cooperation is the rule rather than the exception. In the shadow of later liberty, may we align to protect our children, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Thank you, Deb, you are on fire. She is going to our featured artist next month. So make sure if you can to come back and hear that. Uh, so we're gonna keep going. Um, is it Tia Wycamp? Tia? Ted? Ted. Ted. Hi there, fam. <laughs> Did you, were you a, a doctor or? or <laughs> I swear I wrote, I wrote T-E, but it was an A. So the A I, was actually a D. Well, I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll no, learn a print in the meantime. I, oh, no, I you're good. Thank yeah. you. This is Ted's job. Give it up for yeah. Ted. <laughs> Pam, uh, let me add uh, to the list of people who are gratitude for giving us a voice through our poetry. Thank you so much. Uh, like Pam, uh, she did an introspective of, of herself. You know, that's a lifetime journey. I've been on that. And more recently, in the past few months, I've done some things looking at that. I want to share some thoughts about that journey with you. Two quick things. Uh, if there's any time left, you can applaud that long, either because of pulling short or I quit. Well, either way. It's, 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 it's. Native Americans believe the great spirit exists in all that our eyes see, a gift we must protect while he permits us to live in his creation, we must honor this holy land. What happens to any part happens to all. We are its caretakers. We have not inherited this sacred ground from our ancestors. It is lent to us by our children, as our children are lent to us by the creator. Kind of a different thought, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes I wish you'd have taken my trip back. <laughs> well, anyway. In trying to develop ourselves, sometimes we say, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go discover myself. You got it wrong. If you don't know who you are, ask a friend, they'll tell you. Better yet, ask someone who doesn't like you very well, <laughs> and they will tell you. And sometimes that's good to hear. But this is a thought. Uh, uh, some thoughts. It's actually based on the poetry of Charles Bukowski, an interesting man to read. This is called Creation. Create a new you, then repeat it again. Don't language in the same drainage. Transform yourself and then once more to escape the bondage of irrelevance. Create a new you, then repeat it again. Frequently modify your character so they fail to label you. 
Energize yourself and embrace what you have become. When the standards you create are met, then create again. Stay curious and create a new life you require. It is your existence, your legacy, your today resides in only you. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. I mean, Ted. I know. So, so. <laughs> now, Ted used to join us a lot virtually, and uh, he's been able to join us uh, in person. So, it's so I'm so glad that you were here to help us celebrate. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so as most of you know, I'm really, really bad at names, and I don't know. Charge it to somebody. I don't know. My people on the front row or something. Um, Z. Joe. When I'm right behind you. Yeah. Zakia. Zakia. Can we please have Zakia? This is your first time here, right? Second at the time, at the first time I came was a very long time ago. Oh, okay, okay. So come on up. She uh, gave me some nice flowers to help celebrate. So I just want to say thank you publicly for that. But yeah, come on. So the poems I'm going to be sharing today are from my collection, Stones Hold Water, which is currently in pre-order and is uh, being published by Finishing Line Press. Um, I'm Pakistani-American, so a lot of my poetry is culturally specific to my South Asian experience. And um, I'll be sharing some of it today, and I hope uh, uh, I hope you like it. <laughs> this first one is called The Name of Love. The dust cloud swells into a regiment of high turbaned kinsmen with flat gunmetal eyes. I tremble between his arms, summer leaf, sere before its time. Not a daughter, I am the house of honor, not a son. He is the house of pride. The feudals come, talons extended, old world raptors slavering to pick clean their shamed prestige from our flesh. Brothers, uncles, fathers, butchers, butchers, butchers. I lash myself to his chest as they split open the seal of skin on skin. We splinter like a ship's mast struck by lightning as we receive the unforgiving hurricane of bone and blade our names pass into epic tales that spread across the plains and leap to tongues whenever they couple doomed love and mad rebellion <laughs> This one is called Mosquito Net. To this day, our elders nurse the sting. A favorite son forsook the tribe, his blood gone white. He let the enemy in through the fortifications bribed with honeyed women. They swarmed over our golden grain, sucked the flame from our hearts. Pale at the plague he had unleashed, the sun flew with them only to be found the next day, staked in a field, thorax curved over abdomen, lifeless as a bee after cruel children pin it. Seasons of empty follow, wintering hives starve and buzzards come to roost. The elders have nothing but lessons to trickle into the mouths of young. Every child in the tribe knows, to loot a honey tree, you have to follow a honey bee. Decades later, my cousins and I learn blood ties beneath an ochroid mosquito net until we can trace every thread in the mesh. Buzzy afternoons, we sit shoulder to shoulder and recite genealogies from the Shajra Nasab, recall family scandals, clan feuds, elopements, bastard daughters and sons, 
the mad uncle who hunted shadows with a BB gun. Within the net, honey drips from our chins. The enemy dashes against the tight weave, thirsty for a taste. <laughs> one is called Paper Boats. You and I, on opposite banks of the Atlantic, have shored and scuttled this connection through the deep years. Every time we think it lost to the prudence of halting words, it buoys up, dangerous as the sneaker currents that drag the coastline towards restricted waters. We come and go in broken waves, neither able to find anchor in the other. You cannot promise to stay, and I cannot pace my shore forever. So, today, when the sky rains oceans, I fold poems into paper boats and float them into the future, the way children entrust origami skiffs to roadside rivulets, in the hope that when the high seas between our hearts rise to submerge all bridges, in the lonely recede, you will come upon the flattened hulls and crease sails, brush the silt off my words, and raise them to your lips. <laughs> this one is called Custodian of Remains. A young couple has moved into the Purani Haveli, where fallen branches and dandelion weeds no longer choke the serpentine drive. The shock of roses, roses everywhere. I am still unmended from our time. My eyes travel up the creeper, now restrained with twine, to the second floor balcony, and I wonder if they are bedding in the room where you and I spent every night that moony month of June. Remember when we scared the watchman on purpose? The next day he spoke of the manic laughter of witches. My mouth longs for your kisses. After you left for foreign streets, chasing dreams bigger than the village, I roamed the lanes, waiting for letters that never came. I have given up being the custodian of remains. Know that even the ruins have been taken. Thank you. Kia, thank you for being with us again. Thank you very much. Joe, you traveled a long way to get here, my friend. Come on up. Y'all give it up for Joe. You know, it only takes an hour. Not that, not that big of a deal. And also, I just want to say that I know Pam can pronounce Joe, but my last name is Giannotti, and I thought that's what was maybe tripping me up. So um, in the, what I would consider terrible week that we just had, I wanted to um, bring four poems that are about strong females and female empowerment. Not that any woman needs my help or my defense, but that is what I want to read today. So the, uh, the bookends are both explicitly pro-choice and then the middle two are just about, oh, I'll explain when I get there. The first poem is called Our Daughter Nephthys and Nephthys is the Egyptian god of mourning, childbirth, and the dead. Our daughter Nephthys devoured us, transformed into a hawk, hovered above us, swooped down and plucked us from this earth as if we were cottontails on a dry July mid afternoon. She set us down in the desert we created. We indicted ourselves, even as she midwifed her sister, we plotted against her. We thought of ways to leave her behind, so she haunts us at night not because of our action, but because we were caught in our action. And now we're left to mourn the dissolution of love. Um, I am a teacher and um, I have to put up with uh, parents who tell, their, who, tell their, who tell their kids not to major in anything that doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship with a job. So like accounting is good, but English, I teach English, but English is not, or our history is not, and our anthropology is not. Um, I just read a quote uh, last week about a doctor who said, my biology class prepared me to practice medicine. My literature class prepared me to be a doctor. 
So, um, so the next two poems are about a former student of mine who has blossomed into one of the strongest women I have I have ever uh, been around. I also really identify with that because my mother very much wanted me to go to law school, which I did and then dropped out and became a teacher and she's still mad. About it. <laughs> she claims she's not, but she, she is. So anyway, this is called Demeter's Daughter. I don't know why I have so many allusions today, but um, Demeter, if you don't know, is the Greek goddess of harvest and uh, fertility. And her daughter was Persephone, who I know you all know the, the story that she was sent to Hades, not by her choice. Um, she was abducted and forced to stay there. And then she comes back um, half the year uh, during spring and summer. So this is called Demeter's Daughter. My Persephone tracked the months on the inside of her thigh and the heel of her foot. Four vertical hash marks diagonally crossed, a sixth carved near, and then her return to the world as blood coalesced to collagen. She etched the fickle love of Zeus under the weight of her breasts, broken glass for his absence, sharpened stones for his consorts. In an emergency, a filed fingernail for his disregard abducted while gathering flowers in an unfurled field with 3,000 onlookers, nymphs with the power of wind and sea who ground down lancets, stropped them on whetstones made from blood diamonds and sent her to a wintry home, razors for hands and knives for fingers. Without her, no harvest, only hunger, and yet the green goddess utters no anger when each July she rises, motivated by her scars and yields her irrigated, irrigated crops to care for her castigators and the hoarfrosts of their futures. <clears throat> um, this is about the same muse, I suppose. This is called QWERTY Girl, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, like on the typewriter. Um, it has allusions to the singer's Lord and Lana Del Rey to Sylvia Plath, to the artist Barbara Kruger, and to the um, writer John Green. I'm being very pretentious with my poetry today. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Quirty girl. She hung art on her walls, filled composition notebooks with musings of love and time, a music goddess who collected Lord and Lana when they still played the Vic, stand-up quipster, sketch wisecracker, improv farceur. Normal will not alter her course. Chanel suits every day of the week. It's difficult to find images of Plath in anything informal or Kruger in a smock. Lizzie only leaves upstate in couture. The weapons of war will always outpace strategy. Her path just a shade to the left of the one envisioned. She'll learn that talent born to blue collar work ethic has only two possible destinies. Personal fulfillment accompanied by familial disappointment or a life of misery paired with parental praise. She will learn to reach out, to touch the forest's trees, to swim in the 2 a.m. lake, nothing between her skin and the clear water beneath her chin. She will shout truths to the sky and whisper secrets to the ground. And at the end of the day, she will alchemize her blood into language that does for the class of 2040 what Alaska did for her. And my final, my final poem is very straightforward, beans and rice for lunch. On a rainy May day in Aurora, Illinois, a single protester misquoted the Bible through his bullhorn. He held terrible white signs with dreadful red lies and awful black pictures. In stride, I put my left arm around your shoulders and curved your body into mine a wicker shield to defend your steely self. You craned your neck and shouted incendiaries at the small bald man whose eyes glittered and grew larger while the rain smeared his glasses. Your words fell around him, fomented him, angered him. We escaped his singular gamut. And in the end, it took more time to create than it did to uncreate. We left Aurora and its lonely protester drove down the highway and ate beans and rice for lunch. Thank you. Thank you.
you, Joe. Thank you for making the trip, the hour trip. Um, I don't take that for granted that you come and join us, so thank you again. Um, Lori is online with us. Lori, can you give us maybe? Hi. Hey. Hey, thank you. And uh, thank you, George, for the working with the technology. I know that can be really frustrating sometimes. Um, and thank you, Pam, so much for all that you've done with the Poetry Den. You've really inspired me in so many ways and you've made me write more poetry and you're just a really amazing soul. So thank you. This first poem is called Listening to Yacht Rock on a Friday morning in June. We listen to and sing along to Cool Change, first sung by Little River Band, written by a guy named Glenn. I was eight years old when the song was first released. Decades later, I revisit his words. The hallmark of a good song, like a good story, is that it held up over time. And the song washed over me like the sea, and the song, like the ocean, never seems to age. And I am too in love with the moon, not just when it's full. And that one is called Listening to Rock, Yacht Rock on a Friday morning in June. Thanks. This one I've been working on and actually been kind of working on as I've been listening to other poems tonight. This is kind of based on the, the current social climate. There is rain before the sun. There is rain before the sun. There is work ugh before we're done. Within the storms, there is sorrow. There may be calm in the morrow. Hold on, hold on, the turbulence may fade. Hold on to the light, try not to be dismayed. There is rain before the sun, face the pain, the journey's just begun. That's called There's Rain Before the Sun. So. I'll go ahead and read one more. This is called Tari at the Shady Table. I learned two concepts today. One, I learned that salad can be ordered pre-chopped in a restaurant. Mind blown. And I thank the kindly server for the foodie tip. I may never be the same again, and I may never be the same again, and I may never, ever, ever settle for unchopped lettuce again. Two, I learned a brand new word while nibbling on my chopped salad while reading Leonard Cohen poems. Alone outside at the shady table, I could tarry all afternoon at the shady table, but the restaurant recommends not to linger after an hour. So is it possible to tarry when you have to leave after 60 minutes at the shady table? I may never be the same again after this, never the same. <laughs> this tar at the shady table. I guess I'll I'll read one more if that's okay if there's time. Yeah, you can do one more. Yeah, you can do one more. One more. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Semi centennial. This is for all you fifty and fabulous people out there. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> time to move forward. Time to move onward. Time to leave old patterns behind. Time for keeping the progression. Time to end the isolation. Time to end unhealthy distractions. Time to give outward. Time to reflect inward, but not too much. Time to celebrate our semi-centennial. Time to take flight. Thank you very much for listening. You guys are awesome. Hello?
Saw the end, okay. Try again. Did you want to finish it, or are we you okay with? No sound. No sound. Okay. Are you okay if we? Uh, you okay if we uh, move on, or do you want to finish? We can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now. Yeah. Do you want to finish up real quick, or should we move on to in person? Uh, why don't you go ahead and move on to in person? Thank you, Lori. We appreciate it. And so sorry for the trouble. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, so sorry. Um, no worries. We're going to move on to our feature because we want we don't want to lose our audience for that. And again, we thank you all for being here. There's uh, lots of swag on the table. There's some snacks, whatever's left. You know, it's, it's there until it's gone. So I just wanted you guys to know that in the midst of this. Um, but we do have a featured artist today. And this is Pat Washington, who was... Uh, come a long way to be with us. How far did you drive? How far drive is that? <laughs> Florida. <laughs> anyway, I'm your age. She she messing with me now. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. Oh, from Mich Mich I thought you came further than that. I didn't know that it was. Mich okay. Well, here you go, Mr. Walker. Um, Tia, Ted, Mr. Walker. <laughs> I'm going to read part of the bio that she gave me because it was long and she's done a lot of things and so I'll let her fill in. No, don't do the bio. Cut it. Just All right, she's a beautiful person. She does poetry. <laughs> she is an educator. Um she is uh written and published many things. Um, she's a graduate student of, she was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh, where she was a member of the Africana Studies Writers Workshop uh, under the late August Wilson and Professor Rob Penny, um, chairperson of Black Studies. Um, what else did I say? Taught for 30 years. So you got a lot of educators in here. Just an all around like, beautiful person, writes poetry. She's encouraged me a lot where it comes to the poetry den. And and really, she make, when I'm like, ah, she's like, no, you need to do this. So um, I just want to do that because I want to give time for you all, for you to present. So please give a big round of applause for Pat Washington. You will let us, me and Antonius, know. Yes. Yes. This 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 feature is called past or yeah past, present, present and future. future. Um, yeah. One of the things we need to do is before you leave, please take a look at the table. Um, there are things out there that will give you a bit of an idea of some of the history, the 20th century history of Black poetry in these United States. Black poetry, I'm going to say, uh, contemporary Black poetry began maybe with the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, those folks were trying to pull away from uh, what had been a really horrific experience in terms of slavery and things that had occurred in the early part of the 20th century with the Black Codes. And we moved from that era to the, uh, I would say the WPA, nobody ever talks about WPA, but that was also an era for uh, people who wrote, people who created, people who were artists. It's an era you should know something about as well. And then I'm gonna jump from there to BAM, the Black Arts Movement. Uh, which was the era I am from and that I am a part of from the 60s through the 70s. And that group of people evolved as a result of extreme disappointment with the civil rights movement, extreme disappointment with all, you think there's violence now? Hell, you should have been there in the 60s when they was killing folks. They were killing black folks, they were killing white folks, they were killing students, they were killing anybody could get their hands on because people were against desegregation. 
it was not a good time for people. It didn't matter whether you were a man, a woman, or a child, they would put your butt in jail and you might disappear forever. Those were the good old days that people want to take us back to, forget that. Um, I would also like to talk about uh, BAM, the Black Arts Movement. It was based on uh, some people who decided they were artists, they were poets, uh, they were authors, they were playwrights, and they decided that Black people need to take charge of their own artistic works, that we needed to stop following the traditional English college, no offense, professor canon. Uh, I have all these years of education and 99% of my education was dead white man. So I'm, I'm not real fond of learning new stuff. What I'm going to focus on today is going to be about the black women poets. Most of the people who know about black poetry, you can call the names of every black man poet that probably ever lived, but very few people know the names of the black women poets. But before I do that, Women in the arts are very, very important, and Black women in the arts are critical. I would not be here today if it were not for Dr. Day and for Pam. Dr. Day and I have been corresponding ever since I left, and she would tell me about all these great and fun things that they were doing here in uh, South Bend and in uh, North Central uh, Florida. I thought, wow, I need to be there, I need to be there, I need to be there, <laughs> and then I arrived and I met Pam and the techie man over here. And, <laughs> and I came to the poetry thing and I said, wow, look how diverse this group of people are. Diverse, not just in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of gender, in terms of age, in terms of background. And the poetry was just so exquisite because people were talking about themselves and their lives and then there were people who were really into the various forms of poetry. It was an experience because my poetry group in Florida had been a little rigid, shall we say. <laughs> and I was the only diversity there, so you know how that was. But anyway, um, I want to talk about my journey. I evolved in many ways as a result of Black Arts Movement, but especially uh, this group in Chicago called OBASI, Organization of Black American Culture. It was started by this man by the name of Hoyt Fuller, who was the editor of what was initially Negro Digest and then became uh, Black World. And he brought us together, all these little inner city young people and not so young people, who wanted to write. And this was a man who spoke two, three languages, had traveled everywhere, and he took the time to encourage us. And I will never forget one of the things he said, if you want to write, you have to read. If you don't read, you cannot write. <laughs> I'm gonna take you on my poetic journey, if you will, with some of my early poems and then the more contemporary poems. Um, this one, this first one I want to read is called <clears throat> Night Times. Night Times, when I need somebody to kind of touch me and be for real with, Night Times, you ain't there. Cause your other woman <clears throat> screams blues songs about no count niggas louder than me. Night Times, I wind up sitting here <clears throat> by myself waiting feeling salty water teardrops sting in my eyes creeping karate chops not in my stomach rising in my throat choking your name out of me low moan that echoes round my head night times when i need somebody to kind of touch and be for real with you ain't there man <laughs> And this one called Moonbeam is about a little black girl growing up in Chicago. Hey girl, nobody ever told you it would be easy. So how come you sitting there <clears throat> letting them pull you into little pieces of molasses candy? 
No, who said that sun came up just for you so you could hold it in your hands like a little bitty yellow ball? Guess you found out you just another moonbeam reflecting light from the moon. But being a moonbeam is kind of okay, because girl, you got all them stars to keep you company. <laughs> And this one is a tribute to the women in my family. It's called Sweet Potato Pie. Sweet Potato Pie women, brown with a touch of spice, like the cinnamon stockings they used to wear. Regal women with broil crown hair held in place by hot combs heated in Prince Albert cans. Sitting around kitchen tables, elegantly sipping crown royal from jelly glasses, comparing notes with moms Mabley about the benefits of younger men. <laughs> Friday nights find them dancing in taffeta dresses at family card parties, raucously running Boston's on unsuspecting spouses. They smile, smoking unfiltered pell-mell cigarettes while singing along with Bobby Blue Bland about finding love in the cold heart of the city. Sundays wrapped in fur trim coats, stepping confidently in steel heels, stilettos, hats tilted with just a touch of attitude, mm -hmm. smelling like an evening in Paris. They sought comfort in their father's house where people spoke in soft Southern accents muted by Midwestern drawls. They sang, peace be still with sisters in the choir and shared recipes of homemade sweet potato pie. Thank you. And this last one is a tribute to uh, my grandmother, Big Mama. And when the young man spoke about losing his man, I, I understood. I was five when we lost man, but I remember her vividly. And this one is called Big Mama's Mississippi Breakfast. Mm -hmm. We wake to spreading morning fog, covering flowers, grass, and a dirt swept <clears throat> yard. Sleeping dogs under the front porch twitch while chasing phantom chickens. She stands haloed by heat from a pot-bellied stove juggling cast iron skillets filling the room with smells of sausages, steaming grits, hot biscuits, fresh churned butter, clabber milk, and dark sweet molasses. We rise, running, toe dancing, bare feet in the chill towards kitchen warmth. Loudly, we bless the food and quietly thank the cook <laughs> as she makes her way to the table, filled with bowed heads, hungry eyes, and growling stomachs. I would like to read a poem from one of the poets from um, the BAM movement. There, one of my books out there. I'll be right back. And that will be the last one. And then we can go to the present. This poem is about, uh, is from a, a Midwestern Black woman poet. Uh, she was part of Obasi. Her name is Mari Evans, and it's called Friday Ladies of the Pate Envelope. They take stations in broken doorways, the narrow alcoves and the flaking gray paint. The rain and suit paint clings to their limp-worn sweaters, clings hair and limp-worn soles. They wait for the sullen triumph for the crumpled lifeblood, wet with reluctance, thrust at them. 
in the direction of them. Oh, I like I knocked over one of the things of their reaching of their dry, damp, limp, worn hands. Nomo uh, is a book published by the organization that I was a part of, uh, Organization of Black American Culture in Chicago. Thank you. Uh, now. <laughs> We are having a good time with technical difficulties. Um, I'm just going to share one piece because I, I know that um, Antonius, I know you want to share some stuff. So I'm going to be, well, you know, <clears throat> I get to do this all the time. So uh, I guess I am the present. <laughs> I was like, uh, but this is a piece that <clears throat> I recently wrote. This piece came from a conversation uh, with some folks that um, I used to worship with for a long time. And we had, I mean, and we all like, you know, believe God will, you know, fight all of our battles, you know, and I think the conversation came up about like, um, having a gun. And it wasn't so much for or against, but it was just interesting how the time has shifted our, you know, how we believe and, and what, how we feel and, and the fear that's, that's happening. And uh, the one thing that I said the last time, uh, the first time I wrote, read this was, it's kind of the, the, the oxymoron is like, really, who is really afraid of who? Um, so anyways, this piece is called, You See, We Believed. I have many memories of the black church. It was on Sundays that we were reminded of our self-worth. On Mondays, we were ready to fight any battle. But by Friday, our faith was challenged on every angle. Singing songs like, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Strangely enough, my neighbor's love for me was not always a guarantee, but I was always taught to turn the other cheek. Constantly believing this protected my soul from death. And I guess in return, my moral actions kept me blessed. Yes, blessed, but on many occasions stressed, stressed by the color of my skin. Being born black was not my first win and being created in the image of God, I needed to be convinced. Convinced that an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. But I'm seeing a change on many of my brothers and sisters' minds. You see, we believed with more hatred, more love we would apply. But the challenge is watching the death of my people multiply. Our rights to bear arms, we are preoccupied, and mothers bear the arms of dead lullabies. So that's that piece. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to the big mamas. I had a big mama in my life, 103 years old before she passed away, the most precious grandmother I have ever had. And so you said big mama, and she must have been looking down on me today because I it made me like grin up. Like I'm like, yes. So we're gonna bring up Antonius. He is the future. Black on black crime. Criminals is putting up businesses, acting religious, and still ain't not spiritual. I'm not poisonous, I am the living God, feel for creatures. Still, you're not serious. When is enough gonna be enough? Speaking of all, it's been the one you be talking tough. I be logical, definitions and periods. Talking to Michael, he be checking my uses of comma, and somehow karma does what it does. I might be demonized, but really quiet. Might just speak in the corner and speak me a ride. Never in public, always in private. So my attitude, leave me what options. It's so emotional, everything's pivotal. Opinions becoming subliminals. Maybe it's custom to critical. You can't see that our problems come from the same group of vaginals. Hell yeah, my mama's as black as you. Stephanie came back with proof. There ain't no lies, only separate truths about who you were telling us that you were praying to. 
people trying to hear what you hoping the dog not continues until they can villain, villain do. Listen up, it's points on the parable, points on the package too. Penny picture, penis pack, and felines rip settling for testicles they could have just grown. Hell, you grown, gon' fight for. Got me feeling like the king of the world. Got me feeling like the king of the words. And in case you don't know, then I'm making it clear. This is that black and that power, power. This is that black and that power. This is that black and that power, power. Making that black and that power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Money won't make me simple. Uh, money won't make me simple. Uh, money won't make me simple. Going, it ain't an issue. Focus enough to see you. Hiding behind my people. Lying about your origins. Doing the law and order. Be thinking that we won't notice this. Oppression. Mm. Oppression. Mm. And now I got to be free. Black men. Trying to hang black boys like pilgrims. Either offering them a dirty cup or a new version of Jesus. It ain't crabs in a barrel, it's they bone marrow you're scared of. They've been healing much quicker, been calling each other genius. But all you keep hearing is, that's my nigga. That's their grandparents in them. Two generations staring at you. That ain't anger. You are embarrassed. Because you still don't get it. You get it and still don't give it. You're the type to work for it, die over it, and still don't live it. We call them ass sippers. They try to budget abundance, share hunger, and act humble. Even the women say you act like a broke nigga. And I ain't no token nigga. I got the same respect in my culture as I did at my lunch table. I didn't make it my life. That's part of the hype. I am the product of spite that became foresight. Me mother Isis is born me four in the morning, me mother son gon' rust. But I am a child of the night. Before her, I do not worship. She make a man to fight. So good at listening, I don't have to lie. So good at partnership because I edify mine. Beast of the field, meet the soil. Money won't make me simple. Uh, money won't make me simple. Uh, money won't make me simple. Uh, money won't make me simple. Going, it ain't an issue. Focus enough to see you. Hiding behind my people. Lying about your origins. Doing that law and order. Be thinking that we won't notice this. Oppression. Mm. Oppression. Mm. Oppression. And now I got to be free. Being underrated is making me a card carrying barbarian. Confident in this aggressive behavior. Loving the game like love's definition can't mean this. Make it an understatement because once you ain't the favorite plus better, you become your own patient, your own hater. But most of all, you know ain't no replacement. This driving me ain't pride, it's instinct. Morals not determined by crime statistics, heartbeats, nor a new pair of sneaks. I do this with no sleep, like I only eat once daily. I got the spirit of El Shabazz and Moss number seven pin in principle loudly knowing they clap for him. But they need me. And I ain't a pilgrim partner. My mama got more soul than Seely. I do not want to raise the winner of a spilling bee, and I do not let hoes control me. I was a man by the age of 18, didn't need no prison nor no baby. That's why the pain don't age me. I was made amazing. You know the movement, you don't got to name it. You know the players and you know the ones playing. I've been around the mob since they was 12. Most of them don't got no Facebook page, let alone a hashtag. Money won't make me simple. Money won't make me simple. Money won't make me simple. Going it ain't an issue. Focus enough to see you. Hiding behind my people. Lying about your old, just doing that law and order. Be thinking that you will notice this. Oppression. Mm. Oppression. Mm. Hey boy, we're gonna be free. My name is Antonius Northern. I am the son of Barbara Jones and Antonius Northern. And I have a question. What happens to my father? You see, he's no judge, no attorney. They hung him from a tree called economic slavery. Pine needles injecting, not leaves left bloody from an evergreen 
that is never green. Red like dead debt mortgages survived by a fortunate 500 companies run by men who could barely wipe their own ass but want to call my mama a welfare queen. Then demand my dad for adequate health care and food stamps. You see, when you're the champ, it's not called bullying or being picked on. It's called trying to win, live, breathing. Anyone and everyone in here is entitled to the entitlement, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm talking happy, not hungry kids. I'm talking profitable, not fraudulent. I'm t but I got a question again. I said, what happens to my father? You see? Well, no, you don't. To disappear, he'd need to be here from the beginning, maybe benefit from immigrants, ignorance, and stock dividends, all while screaming, they're giving our country away. As another man works twice as hard for half the pay. Is this show dead? I often viewed fathers differently. And when does he punch in and pick up his schedule for the week? Oh, he's on salary. Well, who has work boots that clean? I mean, what happens to my father? Aren't the hours for our rent evidence not here say? Because you can hear me say. This ain't for apologies. This ain't for I'm sorry's. No, now is the time for discovery of guilt, death, and servitude for centuries. Let's keep it a hundred about the whole thing. You don't fear my father. You fear me. So what happens to my father is no longer your problem. I am. Yeah. White business won't change your real nigga. Oh no. Oh no. White business won't change your real nigga. Oh no. Oh no. White folks think they bought a nigga Mike Colts, which won't switch for you to the gay men and the snowflakes. All wanna be black women. Pimp shit, steal pimp shit, put a queen bee in the field with him. Black man with that court vision won't follow laws, won't speak your language. Killer witch, you turn the fear of us in the entertainment. One thirty second, make a heel, Billy, then they lose pride. Talk a birth race, talk a suicide. You are not a man, you know Doc King, you know Doc Claw. That's the black law. Crackers made them black codes and the black chrome, then so both. We are not dumb. Lyrics burn you like a bad perm. Drip got me when the sauce don't. Shoot the white one, not the black dummy. That's your world, better stand on it. Can't Ride for me, you a lane jumper. James White like that Larry Knuckle. Hall White like his Trump Tower. Dog fighting on center stage. You need niggas, we don't need you. Fear who? You a damn fool. Let's talk a nigga more moves. My brain cold, but my color cool. Basic nigga, miss a plain Jew. Bought the house, that's a plain Jew. Ooh. Cut the block, by the cup of school. Need an angle, I am not an angel. Let it go, let the lyrics take you. Good business, but he's still player. Hate now, but you lose later. If you made more, you wouldn't need a favor. Listen close when I change the flow. It's it's the last part of that. <laughs> Hate fun to the law show when the money gone, don't move slow. White business won't change your real name. Oh no. <laughs> People don't gotta be. Let's try that one more time. People don't gotta be content with you when you're brought. Content with you. You did that? You ever been proud about your confidence issues? When a brother been broken but he still continued? Life like you trusted them people and they hide their lies in you. The type of lie that from your eyes people can't deny that something died in you. That's mine. Yours got alibis. I got sunburnt corneas from staring in the skies. My mind been known true. Coward moments eating enamel when my tongue came loose. Spoke Bible, spent thousands on my Bibles. That wasn't school, that was food in them books. I heard fame in your talk. Then I heard that pain in your hearts. I wondered and found knowledge. Now the plane that I'm on makes me move like the sun. I see you take off and never left your destination. Words that sound like work, but the only ambition is vacation. Musicians silent while I'm playing my God. This is frustrating. Until, until, 
until agents become patients and miners become fighters and candles become lighters and calls become fires and protests become riots and the riots sound like quiet. And the ministers become Malcolm and the pastors become Martin and black becomes power and the time it can still be had with honor and the babies get freedom. I ain't talking about college. You can't buy this with dollars. This is what my ancestors had. This is that Baltimore. This is that Ferguson. This is that Haitian. This is liberation. Flower. And right now, I become Eric Logan and Eric Gardner's new heir and give Obama, Trump, and Biden a reason why Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I ain't pregnant with rage, I'm providing appeal for the day after. You see, these problems that we face ain't part of a phase. These are isms and schisms, and to some people, you ain't people, you capital. And some of your people been telling you. The building is on fire. It don't make a bit of a difference if you black, white, or brown. We are all just trying to stay warm in the other America. in like one minute or like one more? <laughs> one more. One minute then it is. One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. Language is taking form. Hip hop be my soul. Music of my soul. Wasn't born with a flow or, or I'm determined to let glow. I feel like we all culture. I feel like they all vultures. It's time to head up with flex muscle and burn rubber. Glow closer to one another. Hold tight. Let no one stumble. Separate from simple struggle. It's bigger than something social. They saying trust God. I'm saying trust Ra. My skin dog pride large and trees palm. She a queen to a fucking soul when she clutched in the king's arms. I kiss her, she fall apart, you touch her, I let it off. With speakers that sound like fireworks, a peace that you fight for. Freedom that's thicker than tight ropes, if you listen, you can hear their bones. When the wind blow, they go in the petro. Black magic to black gold, the dark parts, the black arts. Some people drums, my niggas is the baseline. The Afro and Afrikan, the soul of the black line. Say it and be a man, claim it and be a king. You leave it, you won't need a grave. My joy is stronger than the pain, passion pulled by the page. Then performed on stage, these rhymes, they mean Everything, the spin of the hurricane, the rush of the heroin. It's amazing. No, it's Kaylee. Treat me like a river, measure me by my flow. Speaking about my culture, 900 and no. Maybe you know our language and still lacking the soul. We coming back for it all. Killer, this be my passion. Queen, this is my heart. See, our future has a lot to say, right? <laughs> uh, man, thank you all for being here. I, I, wow, I don't even have enough words to say, like, just the journey that we've been through. This started really as, um, it really did start as a dream. Um, and, you know, the doors just started opening and we just started doing it. And it has been so many different things. We had, um, I want to give a shout out to my friend Thais Boone, who stopped through before um, we started. She wasn't able to be here, but she wanted to come by and say hello. And so I appreciate her. She was with me in the beginning. And we had a lot of people that were, you know, coming constantly and constantly. And then, you know, people grow and they do other things. But the beautiful thing about the Poetry Den is that it brings in new people all the time. And that's the beautiful thing. People, bring in people, people go out. People come back, people go out, and that's the wonderful thing. You don't want to be stagnant with the, yeah. <laughs> you know, you want your baby to grow and go on out and tell other people to come back. So we have lots of swag, I think, maybe, still out there on the table, free stuff, free, like, maybe some shirts, I'm not sure how many, some booklets or something like that, writing utensils, there might be, Oh yeah, there's no more cookies on there, I don't think. <laughs> there's some fruit out there though. That's probably better for you anyway. Um, there's some fruit out there. There might be some coffee, some tea left. Uh, say hi to somebody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for celebrating 10 years. Um, we meet every fourth Sunday of the month 
except for in, on in December because that falls on Christmas, and so we do we move it up a, a week earlier. We have a Facebook page where you can um, find out things that we're doing here, find out thing, other things that are happening in the community. When people give me that information, I share it. We also have an Instagram page. So much things to keep up with, Ooh, uh, <clears throat> And that one is called Poetry Day in 2012, which is the year that we uh, came about. Um, and then the other one's just called the Poetry Day. Literally, if you say the Poetry Day on Google, it will pop up. So that's a, a nice thing about that. Um, Mark is back in the area. Wave, Mark. I ain't forgot you. He was an another one that was with me a long time, and I, he's back in the area, so I appreciate you supporting us on this uh, special day. And again, to, we can give a big round of applause for Pat Woo! and Tony. <laughs> for the Civil Rights Heritage Center for being here. Um, or for being here, for allowing us to do this uh, month after month. Yeah, I owe you. I might just take that check that. Uh, <laughs> I crack myself up. Uh, so, anyways, have a wonderful summer. Come back and see us again. You can you can message me if you need to message me and all that good stuff. But again, thank you for being here so much. One more round of applause for Thank you.